Hello, everyone. Welcome. And hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Pam Corza. 
and just waiting for our change to spotlights. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to begin with a welcome and a land acknowledgement. Uh, hello, it's Pam Corza, and uh, my pronouns are she, her. I co-direct the Animating Democracy program with Barbara Schaefer Bacon, who is also with us today. Uh, and uh, Animating Democracy is on the unceded land of the Pakamtuk and Norwatuk and Nipmuc peoples, uh, now known as, now known as Western Massachusetts. Americans for the Arts in Washington, D.C. is on the land of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples. We acknowledge these first peoples as uh, having been connected to these lands for millennia and to this day and, um, and give our respect and gratitude that we live and work on these lands and also commit to do work to take meaningful actions to redress uh, injustices of the past and present. Andrea. Thank you, Pam. On behalf of Art to Action, we are based in Tampa, Florida which is on the land of Seminole and Tokabaga peoples. We pay respect to indigenous peoples past, present, and future. And as we grow in our work of decolonization, we build relationships at the speed of trust and endeavor to move from acknowledgement to action. If you are with us in the chat, we invite you to acknowledge the first peoples of the lands that you are on currently there in the chat on HowlRound or here in the Zoom room. Um, please name them and if you uh, need a reference, you can visit nativeland.ca. Uh, so welcome once again. Thank you for joining us uh, for the artistic imagination as a force for change. This is the last in our three-part series, uh, Animating Democracy Reflecting Forward, and we're delighted to have you here. Uh, we're also really excited to have a partnership with Art to Action on this series. Um, some of you may know that many moons ago, Andrea Asaf was uh, the third member of our Animating Democracy team. And uh, in those early years when we were figuring things out, uh, she was really instrumental and um, a, a fabulous thought partner to get uh, our work in shape. And um, so it's awesome to have this opportunity to work again with her and with her colleague, Gabby Vigera, whom uh, we've gotten to know well, and uh, she is supporting the series in all kinds of important ways. Uh, thanks to HowlRound for live streaming and archiving the series. This is our first chance to work with HowlRound in this way. Andrea and art to action have done many things with HowlRound. It's such an important resource uh, for the field for gathering and discourse. Uh, so we want to acknowledge that. Uh, in addition to the HowlRound uh, live stream audience, Art to Action set up a Zoom room uh, so that we could have a little closer connection and at least some visible folks and faces uh, with us here today. But we welcome everybody from wherever you are and however you got here. Uh, Barb, tell us a little bit more about the background for the series. Great. I'll add my welcomes to everyone. It's so good to have everyone here and to be gathered. Uh, we, uh, I'm also in the Amherst and Belchertown area in Western Massachusetts, uh, and so that land acknowledgement uh, stretches uh, to me as well. Uh, the Reflecting Forward series, as we've conceived it, is this opportunity to really consider the practices and the progress of this work of community-based, social, and civically engaged art. Um, so in the, each session, we're bringing forward uh, artists and cultural leaders, uh, some from Animating Democracy's founding years, our work with the Animating Democracy Lab and the grantees uh, and fabulous groups and artists who are part of that, um, and bringing them together with a new generation of leading edge practitioners and activists uh, and thought leaders from arts, the arts and culture sector, but from other sectors as well. Uh, so it's through the lens of their work, three very special people today, uh, that we are um, trying to hear them articulate the questions for today and to imagine the future of creative change work. The structure of today's session and the other sessions in this series, which you can see on HowlRound, includes some context and background on animating democracy, 
a legacy tribute, uh, which we offer each session, and a conversation between our featured artists and guest speakers uh, today, Adrian Murray Brown, Jawale Willa Jo Zoller, and uh, facilitated by Sage Crump. Um, we will invite you if you are on a chat, either on HowlRound or in the Zoom room, to uh, share questions and reflections there, and questions will be gathered and offered uh, to the speakers later in the session. Thanks, Andrea. <clears throat> so we're going to switch to some images and uh, do a little bit of that background on animating democracy. The power of arts and culture to contribute to civic and social change was illustrated by the artists and the projects and the people that animating democracy has been privileged uh, to work with and support over the years. And we wanna take um, just a few minutes to offer a glimpse of our DNA and our uh, 20 year history with partners and peers uh, through some images and words. Animating democracy shown an early light on arts for change work. Taking a practice to theory approach, we've stayed grounded in and supportive of local practitioner driven work. We funded arts-based civic dialogue and engagement projects across the country. And we created welcoming but rigorous convenings for critical exchange and catalytic learning in the field. We asked, what does this work look like? How does the work work? And what difference is it making? And over time, Animating Democracy has contributed to documenting and understanding arts and culture as a space, an invitation, and a catalyst for engagement, dialogue, and activism. With our partners and allies, our prog programs evolved to serve and advance this expanding field of practice. In 2007, with support from the W.K. Kellogg and the Nathan Cummings Foundations, the Impact Initiative began work to position artists and the arts as valid and vital contributors to civic engagement and social change. We created and activated tools and resources to help practitioners, policymakers, funders understand and assess social impacts. We engaged across sectors to nurture an ecosystem of supports and work to inform discourse and policy about quality and equitable practices. As we reflect forward, we see societal changes mounting rather than receding but support infrastructure and leadership for this work has expanded. We are pleased that recognition and resources honor Alana and BIPOC led organizations and artists, and that the leadership for this work is more widely distributed in an evolving ecology of arts for change. For Animating Democracy, we want to gratefully acknowledge the thought partnership and collaboration we've had from so many partners and supporters over all the years. Uh, we especially extend our admiration uh, and gratitude to grantees, advisors, liaisons, researchers, evaluators, writers who worked with us. We thank the Ford Foundation for its generous and early support and all of our funders. On behalf of Americans for the Arts, Pam and I thank you all personally for your vision, creativity, and for powerful work. Thank you. Great. So um, we have uh, one more segment before we get into the main program. Uh, and in each session that we've done so far, we've paused to pay tribute to an artist or an organizer uh, now past who's been part of animating democracy in some way and who deeply impacted our thinking and, uh, and that of the fields. And today we honor Grace Lee Boggs, a true change maker whose seven plus decades of political involvement encompassed the major US social movements of the 20th century and into the 21st. Her views and influence on how change happens and the role of creativity and change making are profound and lasting. Grace's keynote uh, speech at the Animating Democracy 2003 National Conference on Arts and Civic Dialogue in Flint, Michigan, both inspired and galvanized uh, the hundreds of artists, culture workers, organizers, and cultural leaders who were there. And so did the electric conversation that 
happened on stage afterwards between Grace and Roberta Uno, who was then our program officer at the Ford Foundation. It was Roberta who introduced us to Grace, for which we're very grateful. And we're delighted that Roberta has uh, joined us today to offer the tribute to Grace. Roberta is herself a visionary theater director, writer, and thought leader who founded and directed New World Theater at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and in more recent years founded Arts in a Changing America. Uh, in these and many other leading edge roles, she supported the work of countless artists and organizations that are working at the intersection of arts and justice and change. And uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome Roberta. Thank you, thank Roberta. You. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for the invitation to open today's conversation with Jawali, Adrian, and Sage. Um, given the series profound exploration of the power of dialogue, I can think of no one more appropriate to uplift than Grace Lee Boggs. Grace was a social activist, a philosopher, an author, an organizer, a feminist, and she probably wouldn't like to hear this, but a cultural icon who anchored her work in conversation as a deep practice to further radical change. She humbly called herself a practical intellectual and an organizer who read and thought. Her New York Times obituary said, Boggs waged a war of inspiration for civil rights, labor, feminism, the environment, and other causes for seven decades with the unflagging faith that revolutionary justice was around the corner. Her books have amplified her legacy through and beyond her beloved home city of Detroit. And if you haven't yet seen the film American Revolutionary, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs, by the extraordinary filmmaker who shares the same name, Grace Lee, it will be a revelation and inspiration. In the outtakes from that film, Grace spoke about how her mother was sold as a child slave in China and ran away, and how her father arrived in the US nearly penniless. Perhaps hers would be the quintessential immigrant success story. Against great odds, she attained an Ivy League education at a time where there were no job opportunities for women. But she chose instead to align herself with those whose labor was most exploited. She was a Chinese American living and working in the black community in Detroit. Long before intersectionality became part of our lexicon, Grace worked at the nexus of race, gender, activism, and reflection. She spoke about being a part of and apart from the black community saying, I think it gave me an opportunity to be more things than one thing. And you have to stay in a place long enough that you can speak the truth of that place. I first learned of Grace from Nobuko Miyamoto, the Asian American activist and multidisciplinary artist in LA, now in her 80s. Nobuko and I became friends when I was growing up as a kid in LA. Um, and I was first taken to meet Grace by Ill Weaver the Detroit lyricist, performer, and activist who had been part of the Detroit summer project Grace helped start. I mention this because Nobuko is 17 years older than me and ill some 20 years younger. Grace's legacy is multi-generational, not just because of longevity, but because she connected with younger people. Hers was a mutual relationship of joy and love and learning. Grace told us our challenge is to learn from and also not be bound by the past. She continues this conversation posing hard questions that endure for us to grow our souls and transform what we see. And we wanna share part of that conversation from Flint. These are the times that try our souls. Each of us needs to undergo a personal, a tremendous philosophical and spiritual transformation. Each of us needs to be awakened to a personal and compassionate recognition of the inseparable connection between our minds, hearts, and bodies, between our person, physical persons and our psychical well-being, and between ourselves and all the other cells in our country and in the world. 
Each of us stops, needs to stop being a passive observer of the suffering that we know is going on in the world and start identifying with the sufferers. Each of us needs to make a leap that is both practical and philosophical beyond determinism to self-determination. Each of us has to be true to and expand our own humanity by embracing and practicing the conviction that as human beings, we have free will. That despite the powers and principalities that are bent on objectifying and commodifying us in all our human relationship, the interlocking crises of our time require that we exercise the power within us to make principal choices in our ongoing daily and political lives. Choices that will eventually, though not inevitably, make a difference. I mean, how do you change anger into positive change? How do you go beyond rebellion to revolutionary? How do we conceive of revolutionary differently, revolution differently from the way that we conceived it in the past? What are we talking about that we are going to do that will be different? So I, I hope you know, that, that we, we leave here recognizing that, as someone said last night, there are no simple answers. But we have a responsibility, activists and artists alike, to expand the imagination, to increase the courage, and the readiness to think anew in order to address this question, like all the other interconnected questions. Thank you. What we do has to arise organically out of our situations, out of the context. We need biological metaphors rather than mechanical metaphors. There's a paper, outside, I think in the Flint Youth Theater on the table there called Detroit Space and Place to Begin Anew. And on the back of that column, which I wrote for, for the Michigan Citizen, there's a thing called grassroots postmodernism. I think all of us have to begin asking ourselves, how do we think holistically rather than mechanically? Thank you, Roberta, for that uh, very beautiful and moving tribute. And also um, to Americans for the Arts and Inhumane Democracy for that footage and to Gabby Vigera for editing it for us. Um, we welcome you to share in the chat if you're on HowlRound or in the Zoom room, any remembrances of Grace Lee Boggs or uh, the way her legacy has impacted you or your work or your community. Um, and now, uh, with that in our hearts and with that inspiration uh, moving us toward a conversation, we're going. I'm going to briefly introduce uh, our featured guests. Um, we will see bios uh, on the screen for uh, our our speakers, and you can also find them on the HowlRound uh, website for this event. Um, you can see the bio there, but I like to do a brief relational introduction and say that Jawale Zeller is one of the artists, a leading choreographer and thought leader, and one of our most brilliant contemporary artists in the national field of the arts and beyond. I remember as a young artist myself, when I first saw Urban Bushwomen's Praise House, it completely revolutionized my understanding of what theater and dance and live performance could be. And uh, Javale's work with Animating Democracy included the Hair Stories Project, which uh, we might hear more about, or we'll definitely share links. And um, of course, she is a Guggenheim uh, a, a MacArthur Fellow and uh, has a long list of incredible um, accomplishments. And uh, in addition to designing and leading the Urban Bushman uh, Summer Leadership Institute, which is a transformational program. Um, so we're very, very excited to have Jawale Zeller with us today in conversation with Adrian Marie Brown, who, as many of you know, uh, is a thought leader, 
whose ideas and writing and podcasts have spread like wildfire truly through multiple intersecting fields, including the arts, community organizing, facilitation, activism, literature, and much more. And um, we are very, very excited. Um, I know I've been inspired by emergent strategy and pleasure activism and many of her other works. And uh, we really lo look forward to having her live in person shortly, all facilitated by the extraordinary Sage Crump, who, whose leadership I have had the honor of witnessing in spaces such as Alternate Roots, um, the National Performance Network and uh, Lane, um, and uh, through artistic work, uh, such as collaborations with Ill, who you already heard about from Roberta, uh, on, um, on Beware of the Dandelions and Complex Movements, to uh, all of the facilitation and leadership that she has throughout the field, including having served as a board member of Art to Action. And uh, I cannot think of a better person, more um, appropriate to facilitate this emergent conversation that we are about to witness. So please welcome Sage Crump, uh, who will then welcome our guest speaker, speakers. Sage, how are you today? Uh, I am I am bubbling with excitement, Andrea. I am so excited to be here um, and, and really sitting with uh, Roberta's uh, uh, tribute and, and the always inspiring words um, from Grace, let the legacy always continue. You know, and so welcome everyone. We're so excited you all have chosen to, to spend this Friday afternoon in conversation around artistic imagination as a force for change. Uh, uh, I'll add my excitement to the conversation with Jawale and Adrian, both of whom I've worked with closely in, in different ways. And I want to offer us just a little bit of like how to, how to maybe sit in this conversation, right? The, I think there's something really to be said about um, this idea of artistic imagination as a force for change. And as a force, also you can think of force, not just the pushing of something, but as a fulcrum for change, right? Like how does artistic imagination uh, shape how change happens, what it looks like? Uh, and as we think about the transformation of, of the world in which we live, how are we putting our practices in relationship to our ability to imagine a future that uh, isn't determined by, as Grace said, determinism, isn't determined by what we already know, but what we believe we all deserve. And I think this is a body of folks um, who are engaging that in so many different ways. Shout out to folks I'm seeing coming through and whoever's watching, the fact that you chose to be here on your Friday afternoon speaks volumes about that which is important to you. And so I want to invite Adrian and Jawale to come on in and uh, join so the three of us can begin our conversation. Hey, Adrian. Hi, y'all. Hi, Jawale. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> How are you today? Good. <laughs> I'm oh. nervous, and it's a good nervous. Oh. It's, a good, it's a good nervous. But just to be here with you, Adrian and Sage, and Words are not the thing that I feel like are my primary language, so I always get a little nervous. But it's a good nervous. It's an, it's a, it's a wonderful nervous. Yeah, I feel that too. I think of it as like the aliveness of like, wow, I'm being present in something that really matters to me. And you know, if you feel moved to dance at any point, I think we would all be open to it. So, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, be open to any any movement offerings that might happen to just. <laughs> express to express um i want to uh start out with just a few if you have some reflections on the video uh that that we just saw from grace i think one of the the beauties of opening up with that piece is um grace's uh, encouragement to find something new to address the interlocking crises of our times yeah. Um, and I always love like that was in 2003 and here we are yeah. 2022 and I gotta say that feels real on point still mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I would love to hear what's sitting with you all um, from that conversation I, 
holistic. I mean, I, I was at that. I was at that talk at at uh, Animating Democracy, and uh, for those of us that were there, we also remember that she stayed up afterwards talking with us. I think I left at two or three in the morning, and she was still going. <laughs> Um, but holistic, uh, which the complexities of the work that we do are often uh, people asked to divide us up and, and really feeling that commitment to holism and holistic and all the, and the ways it makes our work complicated and it makes us complicated was uh, an affirmation for me. Mm. Thank you. I love that. Um, for me, I I was really moved to an emotional place. I just miss, I miss her. <laughs> I miss her so much. And there's so much that's going on right now that I'm like, oh, I wish I could ask what she thinks about this. Um, and then it's so beautiful to watch these videos and be like, oh yeah, Sherry told us. She called, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh yeah, that's what she thought about it. And that's what we need to be doing. And I'm, I, I love, she's one of the people who I feel made it most um, clear to me how important self-determinism is and self-determination is inside of our collective moves forward. That there was something that's like you, every single one of you, you know, be, before we were talking about things in like fractal as our language, but that way of being every single person in this room has to do this work and figure this out. And everyone we meet also has to do this. Like that's the way to be in relationship with each other is like, where do each of us need to become a part of something so much larger than ourselves? And, and then what is the role that the imagination plays inside of that? Um, I keep thinking of, you know, how to be imaginative in a way that invites more imagination from others rather than in a way that's like, there, the imagination is done. You don't have to do it. <laughs> you know, I'm always like, no, no, no. I want the, I want invitational imagination work. Um, and I, I'm always in that question. So I always was, yeah, I often, I also wanted to ask her what time is it on the clock of the world now from where you're sitting? Mm -hmm. She always asked us that question. And right now it feels like things are falling apart more, but also more as possible. Um, like, which she always made me think. I was like, the more things fall apart, the more yeah. possibility there is for something else to emerge. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Thank you both. I think. Uh, what did you think, Sage? Yeah, I'm sitting. I am deeply in this. Uh, um, uh, the idea of like combating our pessimism is how I often talk about it. Mm -hmm. That that both graces. A lifetime of constantly uh, um, thinking about and re and rethinking, reimagining over and over again in relationship to current context is a continual inspiration for me. Like in a way that never it never gets tired, right? Like it's always something like, and that it is part of the commitment to and the relationship between uh, um, sort of combating pessimism and imagination. Yeah, right? that the inspiration of imagination, the inspiration of artistic imagination, or uh, um, uh, that that helps me stay the course, right? To stay in it when, when we are thinking about these, these interlocking crises and when it does look like things are, are falling apart that I can look at the, the, you know, the garlic, the onions and the bell pepper, <laughs> and, and maybe it's not a, a uh, traditional gumbo because I'm allergic to seafood, but maybe it's a duck gumbo, right? Like maybe it's a like different kind of like, maybe it's something else. And to constantly be able to be in the, it can be that it can be something else. Yeah. And that the search of that, which it could be, feels enlivening. It still feels enlivening in the midst of yeah. it. Yeah, I love that. That piece, you know, she always talks about it's time to grow our souls. Mm -hmm. And I think about that too. Like, it's just like you grow, the most adaptive creatures grow with what's around them, right? So it's like, okay, what is, who is around you? What inspires you about that? <laughs> How can you grow together? So, yeah. Yeah, I think about this also, this, this, um, you know, so much in my life is watching, has been watching things fall apart and then how they come back together and 
things fall apart and then they they find a, you find a way with with a community of people to understand what you need to do next uh, in order to move things forward and um, to write to to write to write things and it's it's a I think when uh, you know when I think about grace it's 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 ongoing work you just don't get it one time you don't get it it's not it's not like it's done it, right. it's ongoing and constant questioning falling down and figuring out how what what the recovery and repair process is yeah. I so appreciate it. I love talking to dancers about falling down, Jalalay. <laughs> you know, falling you talk- is a whole part of our study. Falling, uh-huh. the, the act of falling is a whole part of our physical study. Uh, and, and it's on stage. It, it's a powerful thing. Once you realize that you're at a point of no return and you have to give in to that moment and mm-hmm. surrender and, and relax into the fall and then look at how you how you uh, emerge from there. Oh, mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, I want to, as we're talking about this sort of, uh, one of the things Grace said is, is in relationship to our mind, body, and spirit. Mm-hmm. And so in addition to all the, the beautiful conversations we're going to have uh, about ideas, I also am excited about offerings from you both. And Adrian, we know you are in an exciting new, well, a, a, the shape of a practice that you have shaping your practice in a different in a, in in new and exciting ways and so I want to offer up the space for um for you to share with us a little bit about your artistic you, this arm of your artistic practice that is growing thank you well I have to everyone has to know this that sage it made all my dreams come true so I walk around singing songs all the time and um like getting locked out of places. I don't care because I'm like, oh, I'll just sing the entire time. And then later someone will let me in. And I kept telling Sage about this. And she was like, maybe I could connect you to someone who could help with this and connected me to someone who has commissioned me to do a whole musical ritual. Um, and it is li- really a dream come true. Like I feel like a, a artistic artistic endeavor in a candy shop, <laughs> if, that's, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to share with you one of the songs that has been coming through. Um, And for those of you who are, if you are in New York or Holland or Oregon or St. Louis, those are over the next year and a half, we're gonna be bringing the ritual to those places. Um, But this song that I'm gonna share with you emerged from a conversation with Beverly Glenn Copeland, who I kind of worship and adore, and I think everyone should. Um, So we had this talk and then I wrote this song And it goes like this. Oh, great. Now my face is even bigger. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) Open the way inside you. The universe is your only breath. Surrender to the present moment. What's coming now is all that's left. What's coming now is all that's left. All that's left. Many rivers flow through us. Many creatures become us. Many storms change the journey. The dirt keeps calling us home. See the soil within you. You drum beat, you shimmering leaf. Listen for the sound of sunlight. Live a life that's worth your grief. Open the way inside you. The universe is your only breath. Surrender to the present moment. What's coming now is all that's left. Open the way inside you. The universe is your only breath. Surrender to the present moment. What's coming now is all that's left. What's coming now is all that's left. Mm. Mm. Yoga ball sound. (laughs) I need a drum beat. (laughs) Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you for letting me share. (laughs) And and what a, what a, a serendipitous choice, because again, we just, 
um, we were talking about falling and surrendering. Jawale was offering what it means to surrender. Yes. And then hearing the same words echoed in your song, it feels like there is, um, there is something to be said about creativity and artistic imagination being found in the release. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In the, in the uh, um, not in, not always in the push for something, but in the. In the letting it go. Okay. Yeah, I keep, I feel like this is the main lesson of this time. And it's not necessarily the lesson that I like to learn. Like I've always been one who's like, I made it perfect. Look, I created something perfect. That's how I like to work. And this time is like, let go of everything and then let go some more. And the places where I see us suffering as a species are the places where we're like, I refuse to let go. I refuse to release this comfort, this moment. And it's like, but the future is actually predicated on letting go of a lot of these systems that we know don't work for us and that are not fair. And so as an artist, I think that that's what I keep thinking. How do we invite people to let go and remind them that there's enough, like there's enough, like there's breath. We have an earth that feeds us. <laughs> and we have an earth that wants to feed us and we have so much to offer each other. I think this is actually an interesting moment or day. You know, Twitter is like falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, and I see all these people being like, well, what are we gonna do? That's my community. And it's like everything you've learned to do there, you can do with each other in a million different ways. And we will find ways that are not compromised in that way, right? But it's like every day, what can you let go of today? And what can you let go of today? And um, I will say the only other thing I wanna to add to that is the universe also keeps giving me this other thing, which is like, when you let go of the thing that is toxic, something better is there on the other side of it. And every time it's like, this is a crisis, but it's like, it's okay, because there's actually something better awaiting you something less compromising. You know, I went through a big breakup this year. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> you just have to let things go sometimes. And then um, that line about living a life worth your grief, you know, Sage and I are in this community and pandemic joy community, and it's all like grief. And it feels like a whole community that's bringing our songs and our music and our love to the idea of like letting go and grieving together and recognizing that that might be one of the main activities of community in this time is being like, how do we grieve together mm -hmm. and love each other into something else? Thank you. Right. I feel like, uh, mm. uh, uh, I, I keep hearing you, Jarrell, I just was about to say something like, mm, mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that the aging process is so much, okay, the light is changing. <laughs> oh, it's lovely though. Don't, don't change okay. a thing. It looks okay. so beautiful on you right um, now. Thank you. Um, the aging process is a lot about just letting go and accepting and um, figuring out, you know, what you need to do to be present to how things are changing and then where that initiative is. But, okay, I really need to walk more because I want a positive change there. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I'm accepting about the aging process is that letting go. Mm. I stopped wearing makeup. <laughs> I was one of my just, you know, like, you know, I think I'm just not going to wear any more foundation anymore. I used to do that if there was a Zoom. Like, I, I, I'm mm -hmm. like, nope, I think I'm just letting that go. Yeah. Not lipstick. Yeah. No. Girl. Okay. I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. Let's, not, let's not lose it all but, now. But. but I think part of what, <laughs> part of what that, that's making me uh, um, feel into Jawale is also like in the, in the letting go, we find choice. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between, I'm wondering both of you, either of you, however you wanna engage this, can talk about the relationship between choice and imagination. And so, you know, Grace is, a, is, a, is, a, um, is part of one of the major theorists of the idea of dialectical humanism, the idea of like choice being central uh, to how we think about transformation. It is a great color. Your lipstick, Chawale, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, um, I think there's something, whenever I'm in these conversations, I never want to give the impression like, like, oh yeah, just, you know, just release. It's great. Like just, yeah, you know, like that. But that there is always choice, regardless of whether there's consequence. 
uh, um, well, that there's consequence to choices of faith. But I wonder how you can talk to us about the relationship between choice and imagination mm. and what um, that can inspire in us around what's possible. I go back to my dance. I mean, I think I think through everything about making dances and being in, in, inside of the dancing process. And I'm teaching choreography. <laughs> it's all about choice making. It's all about the rigor of choice making. Um, and I think that's the thing I love about the choreographic process as I'm choreographing my life is that there are so it's it's there is a difference between the hand being here and the hand being there and the hand being there and so the 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 investigation tells me something about what i'm trying to say and why i want to say it uh and why it's maybe urgent to say it and and so the the I love the choice making part of the choreographic process of the um, of the dancing process, because it really asks me to be specific and open and organic and precise all at the same time. And that's kind of where I think about how I think about my life <laughs> is that that's what I'm choreographing um, and how to be how to be those things in the holism and the complexity of, of the movement. Mm. <laughs> and mm. the movement being the, the meta movement and the movement. Yes. Wow. Anyone who knows me knows I love a good framework. So this idea of organic, open and precise. I know, I was like, um, delicious. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's a beautiful, a beautiful place to sit. Adrian, what are, you, what are your thoughts about choice and imagination? Yeah, I mean, I think at the heart of most of my practice around imagination is the desire to re return choice to more of us, to all of us. So, you know, this idea that we're living in an imagination battle, which I learned from Terry Marshall over at Intelligent Mischief. Um, I, I'm like, we live inside of other people's imaginations that are so fortified that we think we don't have choices. Like we live inside, you know, someone imagined us in a white supremacist world. And now we are in this world where it's like, oh, that's a reality we have to contend with. And I think about Toni Morrison all the time saying like, that's a distraction, right? But someone imagined it and that distraction is now so fortified. So for me, a lot of both flexing and stretching and trying to push my own imagination is returning choice to myself. And then doing that in community, collective ideation, collective imagining is like, if we weren't in an oppositional stance at all times, if we could imagine ourselves being in a generative stance, what would that look like? What would we create? What would we want community to look like? And I keep thinking, oh, this is the time when we need to be in a generative stance with our imaginations and building something that we're like very excited to then protect, right? Because I feel like there's a way it can feel like, oh, <laughs> we're backed into a corner. It's miserable. The climate is this and the whites, everything. And it's like, we're just protecting the right to stay alive. I'm like, that's not what we're here for. We're here to love, we're here to generate, we're here to make art, we're here to co-create a world that is beautiful. And yeah, so I think that imagination is at the root of choice. And I also think that it's one of the ways, even when it seems like all the doors are closed, it's one of the ways that we stay open. So I'm thinking about Matulu Shakur, who is, we just learned is going to be released um, so that this last phase of his life can be lived in freedom. Um, but I'm thinking about all these political prisoners and what they've taught us about how imagination has sustained them inside of these cages. And I don't think we're, that different, you know, we all need to be flexing these imaginations um, to get ourselves to stay connected and move outside of any cages that people try to put us into. So yeah, I feel like imagination, as long as our imaginations are intact and functional and practiced, I don't think that we can ever be fully contained by anything 
you know, uh, imagination is our octopus self, <laughs> right? It can always get free. It can always find a way out and it can always find a way forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, love, I, I um, appreciate you bringing in Adrian, like political prisoners and, and, and the imagination of, of um, that we are living in. And I want to kind of connect that to what you're saying, Jawale, about choice being precise. Yeah. And part of how we can be precise is about how we understand what is going on with the world, mm -hmm. uh, what is going on with the material conditions we live in, and what is our either, and when I say response to, I don't mean it in necessarily the oppositional way, but what is that which gets us more free? And so this is the point where I said, Jawale, I'm going to try and find an elegant segue for you to talk about the video about uh, <laughs> the work of urban Bush women and the bold, what you call bold. So I would love for you to talk, kind of set up the video we have and talk a little bit about that work. This video was done a few years uh, back and in it, you'll see Maria Bauman, who was the Associate Artistic Director of the at that time. And Maria is now doing her own beautiful work. And we have uh, uh, Shannon Jetson and Mamjada Spies, who are the co-artistic directors. It's what, what BOLD is about really is the leadership development and how we nurture that inside of the organization and with others. It's BOLD stands for Builders, Organizers, and Leaders Through Dance. So about how we embody, about how we, how we know what we know as dance and take it into movement building. And uh, so this, uh, so when I saw this video, because I had forgotten about it, and it just really, it was a reminder for me of, of this work. So we were doing workshops that were just like all over the place. And I felt like it needed to have to be housed in um, a stronger concept than we're just doing 10,000 workshops. So it was the building of our teaching and facilitation network uh, that bold became centered in and connected to the artistic work. So it's artistic, creative work. So that's a little bit video. <laughs> place matters. So each place has its own unique history and story that's worth telling. And in fact, we can't move forward until we've looked back at the history of a particular place. In the spirit of holism, in the spirit of catharsis, in the spirit of storytelling, how can folks use their bodies as, a, as reclaiming, reclaiming a sense of ownership over this beautiful self um, across lines of oppression, across lines of inequity, and really use the body to tell stories that are important? Urban Bushwomen is a contemporary dance company that was founded in 1984 by Jalale Willa Jo Zoller. And we tend to think of Urban Bushwomen like a body. And so we've got one arm of Urban Bushwomen that is the touring and the performance, creating new innovative works for stage. Then there's the other arm of the work, which is also danced, but not with professional dancers. It's our community engagement arm. Our community engagement takes lots of forms. Everything we do is collaborative. You know, the tool may be the same, but What's on the other side really matters. And as we work with communities, there's a, there's a spirit of reciprocity. And sometimes folks get confused, like what do these two arms have to do with each other? And how do they talk to each other? How do they intersect? And we say, well, they're not disembodied arms. They're actually connected here uh, by our core values. Social justice and rigorous fine art really can be meshed and linked. That wasn't always understood. What are some of the values that we've really come to internalize, such as asset mapping, intent versus impact? So again, it's really a, a paradigm shift from a more outreach, top-down model. We're talking, we said, you know what? This actually is a new model for us. This creates a new model. Not that we're reinventing the wheel, but kind of the two, two day. You know, we're not gonna have a dance class, but we my other deep passion outside of performing is teaching. I love working with young people. So this is um, an opportunity for me to really merge both of those great loves. Um, and I also love that Town Hall gives us the opportunity to not just share with them, but we also get to have classes where we can facilitate with them. We sometimes get to bring them on stage. 
I remember being that person. I remember seeing dancers on stage and saying, wow, I want to be able to do that. What's your mother tongue? You know, are you a step dancer? Are you a poet? Are you an executive? And we've been really lucky to facilitate that in all kinds of settings, from boardrooms to dance studios. We're very clear about our story and the way that we work, but sometimes it is a little bit difficult to frame it in a way that folks can hear it, explaining the, the marriage between these and how they both actually feed into one another. You know, the community engagement work very definitely feeds into the artistic work, and the artistic work feeds exactly into how we facilitate and the, and the unique way that Urban Bushwomen is able to bring out um, community voices. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, sharing, Jawali, and for the beautiful work uh, um, of urban bush women over decades. Just, I was talking about you earlier and and um, the way you have held the community and, and urban bush women uh, for years as inspiration from start to finish, from the founding of, of the company until this moment. One of the things that feels um, resonant, both in in the work of Bold and also Adrian, what I know of the, the, the ritual is, is that it's not, again, not just performance, right? So I gotta say one of, one of my, uh, um, you know, the phrases that, you know, makes your ass itch, the phrase that you're just like, ah, like you guys, I mean, that's just like this, like um, the changing hearts and minds narratives, right? Like that, that's, we're just here, you know, to, to feel differently, but there's also, the fact that that both of you have been really thoughtful in the work around the work's relationship beyond the performance moment itself, or what does it mean to bring folks into the performance moment itself? Um, I'm wondering what does that offer us when we think about artistic imagination uh, um, for change and for change meaning um, not just, yes, the individual and for the world in which we live in and for communities, right? There's something that feels important to each of yours uh, individual artistic theory of change that has community in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us about why that's important and what do you think that does? Mm -hmm. Hey, <laughs> well, I was gonna say, I wanna hear what you say. I, I love this video. This was really beautiful to watch and um, I want to hear what you like. I'm like, oh, you clearly have a lot to teach us about this. So I want to give you first go. But yeah, I, I mean, I, it's, it's sometimes it sounds nostalgic to say I grew up in a community where the community really looked out. Uh, for one another. So I was, so you're raised by a whole bunch of people. Nobody knew where you were. And you, you know, you're out in the street playing. Nobody knew where you were, but you had to be home. But you know, before the street lights came on, mm -hmm. and it sounds like it's this nostalgic thing that that I'm remembering something that was, you know, but it really was how I grew up. And so the, the, these the, there were things that people would say over and over again. Each one teach one. Each one lift one. And I think these were things of people coming out of enslavement and re reconstruction and figuring out how to build lives together that were meaningful. And so community was just a part of how how people came together to survive and to thrive. So. Mm. I never thought about being outside a community. And I think maybe that was the most confusing thing for me when I went to college to study dance was trying to figure that out. But I always ended up back in community somewhere in, you know, with uh, the community dance schools or, or something, I had to come back to that. So I, I don't, I, I, I fear if we're operating outside of uh, out of a community of people, I don't quite know. I know that when I do that, that's not a good thing for me personally. So I, I need to be in that. So I don't know if I can. I just know it's rooted in who I am, what I do, how I grew up, 
and um, yeah, how I make work. Mm, I love that. It shows. <laughs> it shows in the work. I mean, I will say, I feel like I, I had almost the opposite experience. Like I grew up in a military family and it was like moving every two years and community was kind of this prescription that, you know, it's like you land in a place that's like, here's the community, but it was always with a, it'll, you'll have to let it go. You're going to have to let it go. You'll have to change it again. And so part of my adult life has been learning like, oh, community is always the answer and how to build community and how to, how to show up in community. And so, you know, with emergent strategy, the emergence, it was like, what is an offering of community? How do we give people something that's like, you can come and actively practice being in community together. And so with the musical ritual, that it's, it's the same thing, but it's like, not everyone's gonna come to a four day intensive experience <laughs> with their community. Um, and I remember hearing, I, I think it might've been Patty Byrne from Sins and Valid. Someone said, you know, asked her, why do you do shows? Why do you do performances? And she's like, like people might not come to a workshop, but they're gonna come see a show. They're gonna come get entertained. And I was like, oh, there's something here where you can give community an offering that might teach them something, but is not necessarily didactic. And it might give them something, but it's not, there's no transaction to it. It's just like, let's be in it together. And what I'm already learning in this process, I'm collaborating with Troy Anthony and his way of working, even building the songs is to create a choir community. Mm. And so every song, like I'm like singing it into my voice memo, feeling these raw emotions about being numb. And I'm like, no one's ever going to hear this. I'm, you know, I'm like, how do I bring this to community? And I share it with him. He has a whole group of 70 people now singing the song, a hundred people singing the song. And I'm learning what the role of an introvert hermit creator, you know, can be inside of a community in this way. And, um, you know, Octavia Butler is always on my shoulder because she's always like, it's okay, you can be a hermit. <laughs> you can be an introvert and you can still be a meaningful part of community processes. You know, you can write that way and think that way. And I wonder for you, you were talking earlier about choreography and, you know, when I'm writing my poetry, when I'm writing my spells, I never feel alone. Even if I'm, I am maybe by myself in that moment, it always feels like I'm tapping into this river of what we are experiencing, what we are feeling. And I feel that when I watch the, the Urban Bush Woman dance, when I watch these shows, and I wonder if, if that feels similar, like when you're choreographing, is it like a community <laughs> moving in your body? <laughs> Absolutely. And I want to go back to though, the yeah. introvert hermit, because that, that, you yeah. know, that's speaking my language in terms of, <laughs> I'm just like, no, it's, it's really true. Uh, the, the dance makes me social. The dance brings me into uh, a social community. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, I've been performing since I was maybe seven, eight years old. Yeah, yeah. So it is through the act of performing that I really can both connect, um, you know, easily, but at my heart and soul, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm that little nerdy and, you know, person um, <laughs> that can stand to be alone a lot. Yeah, same. And so I think that's an important thing to understand. But I am, and I maybe that's why I'm drawn to performing because it brings me out of mm -hmm. and into connection with others. But definitely when I'm, it's funny, I was just teaching the in my class the other day. I talked, I was talking about how how the the invisible people that are on stage with you. Yes. And so even when I'm performing by myself there's a whole group of people that are on the stage that I'm seeing, that I'm connecting with, that I'm feeling in behind me, on the side of me. Yeah. So the engagement in the room as a performer, mm -hmm. whether there are other people on that stage or not, but you know, that if the room is full that's and right. that's who mm -hmm. I'm dancing with and for and from. I, um, I feel you so intensely. Like when I'm writing, especially now I'm, I'm making these forays into fiction. And I always say like, I'm sitting by myself, but the room is thick yes. and like someone is going to come. Like last night I was trying to take a bath. I was taking a bath. I wasn't, there's was no attempt. I was in the bath. I was taking the bath, but I was trying to relax. I was like, my day is done. I did it all. And then one of my characters comes, mm. um, listen, I need to tell you about 
this thing that needs to be in there. And I am like, okay, great. Let me just give you 10 minutes. 10 minutes, you know, and then an hour later, I'm like sitting in the lukewarm cold bath, whatever, just like, okay, you know, but it's not like I, I really appreciate that, what you're saying, because I feel like there's, and Sage just maybe brings it back to this work of the imagination. It's like what the imagination reminds us that we're never alone, because I also don't think imagination is like, it sparks from my brain cell. I think imagination is one of the ways I dance with my ancestors and I dance with those yet to come is imagination is how grace lives on in me. Imagination is how Octavia lives on in me is I'm like, oh, like here's a thought that feels beyond my comprehension right now, but it's a new, a new idea, but it's never new. It's like, this is what's coming down the river of all of us, you know? Um, yeah. Anyway. Thank you. <laughs> You're reading my notes, Adrian, over here. <laughs> listening to you all, I'm thinking about the, the uh, Jamaican British uh, uh, cultural theorist, Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall says, there is no genesis, only genealogy. Okay, that's right. right. Like in the same, like, oh, it's not just a, like, there's always a genealogy. There's always a community. There's always, in, yeah. even in the, in the way that uh, Andrea referenced uh, alternate roots, they talk about community of place, tradition, and spirit. There's yes. always like uh, exactly. multitudes. We can say yeah, multitudes. and like, I love the idea too, that sometimes you know, part of what drew me to Grace, because I, I was very skeptical with Grace Lee Boggs at first, because mm-hmm. everyone around me was just like, Grace. And I was just like, who, who, <laughs> one person can't have all that power. Like, why is everybody, you know? But then I met her and I was like, oh, Grace, got it, boom. But the thing, one of the things that always moved me was I would feel like I was having an idea. And then I would read a book of Grace's where she had written that idea down 40 years earlier. Mm-hmm. And so I had to contend with, it's not that I didn't have, that this didn't originate in me, but it wasn't original, if that makes sense, right? That it's like, when I, the things that I love the most are those that have lasted throughout history. Like I'll read something from Rumi, or I'll read something from Lao Tzu, or I'll read something, and I'm like, humans know this. Yeah. Like we know this, and we keep dancing with this knowledge we know it, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I, I when you said that, I just uh, earlier uh, there was Sekou Sundiata's name that was there. Yes. That, I was just yeah. listening to his music the other day, and the um, I think it's C. I can't remember the name. Forever C, maybe. And it's uh, from he says from this one thing comes ten things. Yes. I think that's, and I and I think in cultivating imagination it's really understanding that it's inspiration is around you all the time in every single place. Uh, and and uh, one of the, the uh, directors that we worked with for many years, Stephen Kent, a director in Los Angeles, and Steve, Steve would help give us the tools and the technique to understand how to see and access that. So it's not just for granted, but, um, so that you, so that that you, your your presence are like everything, and I think that's the reason that I really always loved riding on the subway. Yeah, yes. <laughs> all of the challenges. Is great for that. It's just the same like, way on the plane, oh, but also yeah. Ian, I'll show you this. I hope y'all can see. This is my ancestor altar space, yeah. and it's just you know, for whatever reason, this place. I was like, this needs to be in my office. This needs to be here. So that whenever I'm sitting here writing or talking to you all, I'm like, you know, it's all around. It's all around. And there's a way then that it also makes me feel very hopeful about this moment, right? Because I'm like, it's all changing, but we are shaping it also. Like we are choreographing, we are casting our spells, like we are actually shaping this. And I have, Sage, is this a good time to ask a question if I have one? (laughs) Yes. Yes. So I have this question. You talked about this, like what aging has taught you about creativity and both of us in, in, I think all of us in some way, our body is a core part of the instrument with which we are creating. And so for dance, it's like the body, like physically being able to move the body in certain ways. And for me, it's like, I think in song and a lot of it is like trying to figure out how to sing. And I want to I would love to hear anything you can share about what creating looks like as your instrument literally ages and what becomes more available 
as maybe some things become less available? I would say in the beginning, when I first formed the company, maybe 70 to 80% of the material that was generated came out of my body uh-huh. in a collaborative process. And then over time, because my physical imagination is very different than a, a younger generations. Yes. So over time, I think that's probably maybe now 10 to 20% might come out of my body and, it, and, and what's coming out of their body. Because I'm not going to imagine some of the ways that that they are falling, swirling on the floor, breaking, you know, I, I, that's not in my body's imagination. So I think it's really understanding that it, it's just a shift. Mm-hmm. Um, I still have something to offer physically. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's, I, I, it's, it's learning to maybe respect that. So I think there was a period creating with the company where I just kind of pulled away from things coming out of my body because I didn't I didn't trust it anymore and oh it's not that good it's old-fashioned it's you know it's another generation blah 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 blah. and I kind of pulled back away from that yeah and what I had to learn to understand is no it's it's different it's present but but I need to be present to what I'm seeing in the room from others and then what's coming up out of me and trust their reinvention of what they're seeing coming out of me Uh is fabulous. Yes. And and guided. Oh, I love that. I love that. I mean, it's, that's helpful to hear because so much of it, I keep thinking there's something about accessibility in it. Like there's something about more people being able to access and co-create. You know, when I was a younger singer in my twenties, I had like this huge octave range and I was just like, everything I sang was like, "Ah!" you know, like way up in the rafters. And maybe those were great songs, but nobody else could ever sing them, (laughs) you know, Uh, or or you'd have to be a trained singer to pull it off. And now I feel like I'm writing songs that are more available, like more voices can sing them and more people can hear them and be like, yeah, I could do that, which actually maybe feels more important to me now that more people, you know, that's like, how do I have less barriers? to what I'm creating rather than what I used to think was like the ultimate rigor of perfection, you know? <laughs> so um, this is helpful to hear for me. Mm-hmm. And Jawale, you, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was an exchange for, for you guys, Adrian, any question? Uh, the question well, I had a question, but I've changed it. That's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this, you know, I was, I was so struck when I read Emergent Strategies, you know, my mind was completely blown Mm. when I read that. And I love, one of the things that I love doing or is, is I connect more to writers writing process often than I do to choreographers process. Uh I read lots of books or things about how writers find what they're doing. And I'd love to know the many, I'm sure there's many processes about your writing process. Oh yeah. I mean, well, I just told you one, one is that things, you know, come along and they mm-hmm. grab at me. Um, emergent strategy in particular felt like um, a collaborative work with spirit, a collaborative work with something beyond myself. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, if I, I think the best way to describe it is it's like something beyond myself came down and partnered with the part of me that was discontent with how things were. Mm. So I was doing movement work. I was in nonprofit world. I was trying to do this dance with philanthropy and trying to help people make change. And I was so frustrated. I was so like, we're never going to make change this way. Like we have to figure out something else. And then laying on my back in Mexico, exhausted and trying to figure it out. There's ants crawling across the ceiling and they're like, we know something about this if you'll listen to us. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing kept happening with schools of fish when I would go in the ocean, like the earth was just like, girl, you are frustrated for good reason, but y'all are not the smartest creatures. Mm -hmm. You know, like this, it really was like a shaking off of the human supremacy or human prioritization of, of thinking. It's like, survival happens in all these different ways. So a lot of it just poured through. And then I think the thing I've gotten better at over the years is then sharing my work with others and being like, where, what am I missing? Help me see what I can't see on the page. Um, So like emergent strategy, I was mostly done with it. I was like, I've got it. 
And then I was like, but, but I need other voices in here. It's not enough for it to just be my own voice. And then I reached out to all these people and I was like, how has nature taught you? And this is where, you know, I think there's maybe a choreography or a curation because I think one of my gifts is weaving together lots of voices and lots of ideas and lots of ways of thinking. And I love doing that. Like it brings me intense joy to be like, oh, this quote with this one and then this thing, you know, like I get so excited about that. And um, yeah, so my process, you know, a lot of it is, is that it's just being like, let me hold on to this and I'll figure out a place to put it. Or do these people even know that they've come up with these gorgeous ideas that are in conversation with each other? Um, and, and then there's the rapture. I, mm -hmm. what I think of is the rapturous writing, the rapturous process where it's just like, I have written a lot of my work sneaking off into a bathroom because it's like, it's here right now and I have to do it. And I can't even explain to anyone. You know, if you try to say like, I need to take 10 minutes in the middle of dinner to write, <laughs> people are like, what? But if you're like, I'm gonna go to the bathroom, no one argues with you. <laughs> so I'll run into a bathroom at a restaurant. I've run into bathrooms <laughs> during Thanksgiving dinner, whatever it was, and just been like, I'm back in an hour. They're like, what's wrong with your bowel system? I'm like, nothing, <laughs> nothing is wrong with me. I'm fine, but I just wrote something that people will read and I will, you know, that's how I also feel connected. When I write something that, hmm. um, when I write something, the things that I have written that have the, had the most impact, like I could feel it when it was, you know, like I put the period and I was like, wow. And it's usually the most vulnerable thing. <laughs> like, I'm like, I could never say this to other people, but, um, which I wonder about too, for dance, I, you know, like, I, cause there's so much that's just like, I grew up as a good girl. I grew up as someone who was like, there's just things you don't say. There's things you don't question. And a lot of my writing, especially heading into the pleasure activism territory, and I'm like, I'm writing about squirting. I'm writing about these things, but I'm like, but they do need to be written about. And I can feel when I write it, I'm like, okay, that, you know? Um, and then as I get older, I let more and more people edit. <laughs> so I think that's making me a better writer too. I love that. I, I think of myself as a quilter, really. Yes. And I get sometimes, sometimes I feel like I've, I get the credit, but, but there's these, what I know how to do. And this, if you've been around the Summer Leadership Institute, you know that like these hundred people and taking that and making it feel like one yes. cohesive vision yes. Is, yes. is just, that is absolutely where my joy yeah. is. I mean, it's taken a long time to see that that's a gift. You know, for a long time, I was like in the background of my own creation because I was facilitating. So I'd be like, something magical happened. And you know, in Lao, Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching, um, if the master has done his work well, the people will know that they did it themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And to me, that always feels like the highest, you know, I'm like, that's what I wanna aim for is even to write a book where eventually no one remembers my name, but everyone remembers these ideas. Like people just like, oh yeah, the ants. <laughs> like to me, that'll be the ultimate achievement or the ultimate success. Um, although in this moment, it's nice to be recognized enough to be able to continue to do the work, right? So there's that balance of like, thank you for seeing me enough to let me keep going and um, and how to keep weaving and weaving and weaving, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. Those are such juicy questions of each other. We have maybe about five more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to take one of the questions that's come up from, from the chat. Okay. Uh, and and uh, um, I think Adrian, you, you sort of teed this up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it a step back because this person is referencing pleasure activism and talking okay. about justice being one of the most pleasurable experiences we can have. And a lot of us think about Tony K. Bambara making revolutionary making revolution irresistible, right? Like, yes. um, and so, I'm, and um, so I'm holding that like pleasure, making it irresistible, also in relationship to choice and imagination, right? Because what we also said earlier is like, choice has consequences, right? Like some of them feel great, some of them no. Or, or how do we get, how, do, how does precision, and I'm sitting, I'm sitting with that job and I will for a minute about, or, because you said something else around the relationship to the other, 
other bodies and bodies imaginations of the other dancers. And I was like, oh, that's the openness, right? Like it's the organic, open, then precise, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what, and, and the question from the person is that um, would love to hear both of you talk about the idea of pleasure in relationship to artistic strategies for change making. I don't know. I'm just at a point in my life. It's got to be fun. It's just got to be fun. I, you know, I remember years ago when I first started the company as a company member, Anita Gonzalez, wherever you are uh, mm -hmm. in DC. Uh, and Anita said to me, because I was so intense, I was so intense. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, this can be fun. Yes. And I was like, no, I'm an artist. Oh. <laughs> and, and I think just for me now, it's like understanding that even in the most intensive places of investigation and all of that, that the joy, bringing, bringing the joy into the room yeah. is just, you know, that's, that's just where I am now. But there'll be many people who worked with me over the years that will testify in a different way to working with me because you know the, the joy was hard hard you know hard to come by but that's where I am now that it's got I've got a it, ah yeah, yeah. Can I ask for just just one more peel back what does the joy offer you why choose the joy open heart mm -hmm. it is it's it's the blissful relationship to when you the the openness of your heart compassion um, you know, because you know, I, I particularly growing up in the 60s and 70s in the political movements of so much judgment, so much hard edge, so much, you know, we're for the revolution and, you know, you're not either you're for or you're not. And it was just a lot of hard, hard edge. And so I think for me, the joy and the is, is really the opening of the heart. And once that's open, then you can you can give and receive uh, in more fruitful ways. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes. I mean, all of that. I really feel I've been thinking a lot about my energy lately and how if I'm not experiencing pleasure, like if it's not, if there's not a pleasurable aspect to what I'm doing, it's actually very easy for me to dip into despair. It's very easy. There's a plenty of it in every direction. And I, I started to notice that, that I'm like, there's so much work to do. And there are different people cut out for every kind of work, right? So I've never gotten pleasure one day in my life from working on a budget. I know people who love that shit. They are like, I love budgets. <laughs> see, all right. So for me, I'm like, oh, like, let me move towards the thing that gives me pleasure, right? Which is this writing work, which is singing these songs. I have other people in my life who are like, that would terrify me. I would hate that. I don't do that. And I'm like, I think that there's a clue that what you get pleasure from is actually related to what your calling is, what you're meant to be doing in relationship to the community. And I think if everyone's actually following that calling, everyone finds the work that needs to be done, you know? So there's part of it that's that. There's also part of it that's like, I wanna do a lot in this lifetime. Like I am ambitious still, and I wanna create a lot. And it's not, now I feel like I have hard proof Every project that I've worked on where I was having a pleasurable time while I was creating it has had like a massive reach. Like that's the stuff that people are like, yes, I needed to, you know, I was like, is anyone going to read this little book about ants? Yes. I'm like, great. Cause I fucking loved writing about these ants and I want to talk about ants for the rest of my life. And then pleasure activism. I was like, can I take the risk? Will people take me seriously as a leader? If I talk about the fact that I think an orgasm every day is a crucial part of being alive turns out absolutely people are like you liberated my practice and so now it's the same thing where I'm like is it okay even in such a serious time to go say I want to make some music and I want to make spells <laughs> you know and it brings me so much joy and so far the universe is really responding with a yes and there's so many people who are like we do all need to be singing our way through this that's what we've always done to get through hard times as we sing and we make love and we craft things and we dance and we find our way through it. Um, and yeah, I, I also think it's like, this is the construct we live, the construct we live in 
distracts us from the fact that we are wired for pleasure. Like, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to mislead you. I'm trying to say, go back to your body. Your body will tell you. I don't have to tell you. Your body will tell you. You're wired for pleasure. Like run a feather along your collarbone. <laughs> I didn't make that up. <laughs> like whoever created you, crafted you with all these nerve endings and whoever created us made it so that we hug each other and it feels like home, you know? All of that is important. I think it's what, I think it's the clue of where we're supposed to be heading. So I'm like, yeah, if it's not pleasurable, I don't want it. Well, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to get the courage to write because it's really difficult for me. It's joyful Let's talk about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm so inspired by you because, like, okay, Jawale, you can do it. Well, and you know what, Jawale, and I tell Sage, Sage knows about this. I tell people this all the time that I'm like, there's many ways to write. And I think sometimes people are like, they think about this one way of writing and it's like, that's terrifying. But just now on this call, you have dropped gem after gem, after gem, after gem. You can talk a book into being, we can transcribe it. We can gather it. We can edit it. We can figure it out. But like, all you have to do is just know what you know and say what you know, and we'll take care of the rest. We'll get you. We, we, we can talk about it. right here. You heard it here first, y'all. Jawale's book <laughs> to be manifest and. Yeah, because I also do think in this period of time, there's this thing that happens with a book that is meaningful. It's, it's like there's, we do have to be writing our stories down. I was listening to um, Angela Davis and Fania Davis were in a conversation recently, and Angela was talking about how she remembers when there was only one book about Black women's existence, and she had it on her shelf. And then now that there's so many that she can't have one shelf or one room or one place in her house for it there's just so many books and I'm like yeah now we're now getting more specific in this precision piece what are the stories that need to be told right now and yours is absolutely one that's very exciting it is absolutely yeah. one <laughs> I'm like this conversation has been uh, um, a part of that and so just grateful and thank you to both of you yes. for saying yes for showing up for your generosity for your brilliance, for your excitement, for your fangirling of each other that we all are feeling <laughs> in the moment <laughs> that led to, to such aliveness and such excitement. Um, yeah, thank you for your time and everyone. I'm gonna invite- Thank uh, you for guiding us, Sage. Absolutely, uh, uh, and Pam back into uh, the space. I can only reflect what is happening in the chat to say that we have been hanging on your words. We have been- noting them and they will they will be shared uh mm -hmm. often uh uh and yes to pleasure and joy that this has been uh, we are so grateful to you adrian jowle sage uh because you bring it's an authentic conversation that you gave to us um and because you bring your whole selves voices and bodies into the world all of the time uh as artists and activists uh to, and you do it with power and uh, not meant as a pun, but in honor with grace. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, quite beautiful. It is how you show that your values are reflected in all the ways you do and think about your work and work with others. That is, is the big motivation for me. And thank you so much for being here, Pam. Oh my goodness, <clears throat> that's that's a hard uh, thank you to follow. <laughs> uh, I want to express my appreciation to all of you as well, uh, but I also want to lift up the folks behind the scenes who have helped to make uh, this session possible. Uh, certainly Andrea and Gabby at Art to Action, amazing, amazing partners to work with. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, Tanya Neumeyer, uh, our tech person, has been an extraordinary ally to make everything smooth and wonderful. I uh, love working with them. And um, at HowlRound, Thea Rogers, Vijay Matthew, Jamie Gallen, thank you so, so much for all of your support. Uh, and at Americans for the Arts, Anne Marie Watson, Daniel Richtmeyer, Michael Chodos, Teresa Coleman, and Narielli Serrano. Um, thank you to everybody for for all that you did to make this a, a really amazing session. I want to just add on to the thanks. This was a dream conversation that I was hungry for, and I am so grateful to all of you for saying yes and showing up and being 
110% present as you always are and sharing your wisdom and brilliance brilliance and experience with all of us. I also want to say thank you to Animating Democracy, of course, for this wonderful collaboration and partnership and to HowlRound. And if you are watching and you want to see the previous sessions in this series or just rewatch this one because it was so good and juicy, um, you can visit uh, HowlRound and, and just look up the Animating Democ Democracy Reflecting Forward series on HowlRound or uh, stay in touch with Animating Democracy and Art to Action. I also want to give a shout out to our DJ, Cotton, for the music, intro and outro. And thank you all for being with us. Thank you.